In this video, we will be discussing the doubts put forward by students. So question one is optic atrophy leading to blindness, bone loss, loss of hearing, frontal bossing and cranial nerve palsy are features of and here are your options osteopetrosis, osteitis deformans, osteogenesis imperfecta and osteitis fibrosa cystica. Now, out of the given options, we can immediately rule out uh, C and D. Osteogenesis imperfecta, we know, will cause fragile bones, blue sclera, loose joints and dentinogenesis imperfecta. Whereas, osteitis fibrosa cystica is seen in hyperthyroidism when the calcium levels in the blood serum will rise leading to bone pain and tenderness and in the final stages uh, you see certain brown tumors in bone which are known as osteitis fibrosa cystica. We can also rule out Paget's disease even though it is a differential diagnosis of osteopetrosis. Uh, Paget's disease the clinical features will be bone pain, pathological fractures, cranial nerve palsies due to nerve compression, increased hat size due to skull enlargement. The maxillary bone is the most common bone involved in the skull. Our correct answer is osteopetrosis which shows pathological fractures, cranial nerve entrapment neuropathies or neural palsies, frontal bossing and visual impairment due to retinal degeneration. So in the question, let's underline the word optic atrophy and frontal bossing. So we'll go with osteopetrosis. Now our next question is orange peel appearance is seen in monoosteotic fibrous dysplasia or polyosteotic fibrous dysplasia. So as we know uh, fibrous dysplasia is a disorder of osteoblastic differentiation and maturation with two variants uh, monoosteotic fibrous dysplasia which usually involves single bone and polyosteotic fibrous dysplasia involving two or more bones. It is also known as McEwen Albright syndrome. Now, the orange peel appearance is classically seen in uh, monoosteotic fibrous dysplasia. It's a type of radiographic appearance. So, three types of radiographic appearances are seen. Either it's seen as a small unilocular or radiolucency or a multilocular radiolucency with a well-defined border containing a network of fine bony trabeculae. Now, sometimes due to increased trabeculation, they will render the lesion more radio-opaque, giving it a mottled appearance. And finally, the lesion becomes quite radio-opaque with many delicate trabeculae traversing it, giving it a ground glass or pour the orange peel appearance, as you can see in this diagram. Our third question is median rhomboid glossitis is associated with options are oral cancer, fungal infection, bacterial infection and burning sensation of the tongue. So we can immediately rule out uh, oral cancer as it's not a precancerous condition or lesion and also bacterial infection. What exactly is median rhomboid glossitis? If you remember, tongue is formed by fusion of two lateral processes which are known as lingual tubercles which meet in the midline and fuse above a central structure known as tuberculum impar which is derived from first and second branchial arches. Now, if this point of fusion is defective, it leaves a smooth red erythematous mucosa in the central portion of the tongue where there is absence of filiform papilla. And quite often, this area is extremely prone to atrophic candidiasis. So recently, the term chronic atrophic candidiasis, posterior midline chronic atrophic candidiasis has also been used for this lesion. So our correct answer is um, B, fungal infection. Option D, burning sensation of tongue is a symptom of the fungal infection and is not seen in all the ca cases. Coming on to the next question, shell teeth are common in this variant of dentinogenesis imperfecta. Here are your options. Sir. The correct answer would be C, type 2. So extensive studies have proven that dentinogenesis imperfecta is a distinct entity from osteogenesis imperfecta. The two are not linked which led to revision of Shields classification. So according to this revised classification, there are only two types. Type 1 dentinogenesis imperfecta without osteogenesis imperfecta where we have a blue-gray uh, opalescent teeth with bulbous crowns, narrow, uh, uh, narrower than normal roots and obliterated pulp chambers. 
And type 2 dentinogenesis imperfecta, which is the brandy wine type, which was earlier classified as type 3. So out here you have um, large pulp chambers and root canals with amber smooth dentin, which bears down very quickly, giving classic appearance of the shell teeth. So the answer is C. Any such kind of question, we'll always go with the latest classification. Moving on to question number 5. In which of the following conditions, pulsations or murmur can be detected? And the options are capillary hemangioma, osteogenic sarcoma, epidermoid carcinoma, and osteoid osteoma. The correct answer is B, osteogenic sarcoma. However, the clinical feature given, pulsations or murmur, is not pathognomic for uh, uh, any of the four lesions. So let's also rule out this out by elimination. So first, let's look at capillary hemangioma, which is a benign abnormal overgrowth of endothelial cells. Uh, and in the definition it says, says without pulsation or brute. So this is definitely ruled out. Our third option is epidermoid carcinoma, which is a um, neoplasm of uh, epithelial origin with pathognomic feature of squamous cell differentiation showing keratin pearls. And the classical features here are ulceration and induration. The fourth option is osteoid osteoma, which is a benign neoplasm primarily seen in young children with slight male, uh, male uh, predilection. Uh, patients usually have sharp pain, which tends to worsen at night and localized swelling. And why we have gone with osteogenic sarcoma is that it's mentioned in Schaefer's that it's a malignant osseous neoplasm, which originates from primitive mesenchymal cells. There'll usually be a tender palpable mass with or without overlying pulsation. So even for osteogenic sarcoma, it's not necessary that the pulsation will be present. But given the options, we'll go with osteogenic sarcoma. Now, our sixth question is, failure of descent of thyroid analogue can be seen in the tongue. And your options are A, in anterior two-third of dorsal aspect, B, in posterior one-third of dorsal aspect, C, near the base of tongue, close to foramen cecum, and D, in anterior two-third inferior surface. So our correct option is option C, near the base of tongue, close to foramen cecum. So if you remember, uh, thyroid gland uh, develops from the ventral floor of pharynx by endodermal invagination. And around the same time, your tongue is developing along, uh, in the pharyngeal floor. And the tongue is connected to the thyroid gland by a thyroglossal duct. In, uh, and the remnant, the adult remnant of this duct is foramen cecum. So if the thyroid nodules, uh, follicles, fail to descend along this thyroglossal duct, they will be seen as lingual thyroid nodule, which is seen as a uh, swelling near the base of the tongue close to foramen cecum. Coming to question number 7, which says interferon gamma release assay is used for diagnosis of and your options are A, HIV, B, syphilis, C, hepatitis B and D, tuberculosis. The correct answer is D, tuberculosis. Now, as the name suggests, so this test probably involves uh, the release of interferon gamma, which is a cytokine secreted by T cells. Now, the basis for the test is that uh, blood from tuberculosis patients, suspected tuberculosis patients, is mixed with antigens derived from myobacterium tuberculosis and then the amount of interferon gamma released is measured. This test is only used when Mantox and other diagnostic tests are negative. The other the disease where this test is used are uh, cytomegalovirus infection and leishmaniasis. Both of them have cell-mediated immune response. Now, question number eight is, which of the following conditions is least likely to be present as an eccentric osteopathic lesion? Your answers are A, aneurysmal bone cyst, B, giant cell tumor, C, fibrous cortical defect, and D, simple bone cyst. The correct answer is D, simple bone cyst or unicameral bone cyst. Now, these are just cavities within the bone which are filled with fluid and uh, usually patients are asymptomatic and are discovered only during routine x-rays. 
However, because they do weaken the bone, sometimes pathological fractures can occur. They are usually found in the, they are intramedullary in nature and found in the metaphysis region. Then let's look at our other options. Our aneurysmal bone cyst is an expansile eccentric uh, lesion. It's also known as solitary bone cyst and usually associated with history of trauma and patients will complain of pain, swelling, pathological fractures. The pathognomic sign here will be uh, on entering the lesion, there will be excessive bleeding. Almost the site will well up with blood and will have a blood-soaked sponge appearance. Then our giant cell tumor, tumor or osteoclastoma is the neoplasm of undifferentiated cells uh, with pain, swelling and this is usually seen near the joint. The In the most common bone is femur and it's located near the joint. So it's again eccentric in position. We will also rule out fibrous cortical defect which is nothing but non-ossifying fibroma smaller than 2 to 3 centimeters in diameter. Now these uh, defects are usually... Uh, you know, loca are, are located in the uh, long bones close to the growth plate, making them eccentric in position. Now, moving on to the next question, which of the following has potential of undergoing spontaneous malignant transformation? Your options are A, osteomalacia, B, Albright syndrome, C, Paget's disease, D, osteogenesis imperfecta. The correct answer here is C or Paget's disease. Now, Paget's disease is characterized by increase in alkaline phosphatase, which is a marker of the osteoblast. So, you have enlarged and deformed bone because of um, excessive breakdown and unorganized repair. So, the bone will be deformed, but the mechanical properties will be compromised. So, um, they can spontaneously develop into an osteosarcoma. A quick look at the other options. Osteomalacia is the adult form of vitamin D deficiency. So the bones will fail to calcify. So there will be softened and weakening of bones. Albright syndrome is nothing but polyostotic fibrous dysplasia uh, where there is uneven growth, deformity and uh, pathological fractures. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a genetic condition characterized by blue sclera Deafness due to osteosclerosis, loose joints, low muscle tone and triangular faces. There are various forms of this disease. Now our tenth doubt is that tender submandibular salivary gland is most commonly due to which condition? Your options are A. Ludwig's in China, B. Cialolith, C. Enlarged lymph nodes and D. All of the above. Out of the given options, the correct answer is Cialolith, especially in patients older than 40 years of age. Now our next question is eruption cyst. A. Transforms into dentigerous cyst. B. Regresses after the eruption of teeth. C. Is found in place of missing tooth. And D. Is a type of dentigerous cyst. Out here our option uh, answer is B. It will regress after eruption of teeth. Note that eruption cyst or eruption hematoma is actually only present within the soft tissue. It is associated with an erupting tooth and is seen as a circumscribed uh, soft fluctuant swelling. So it usually occurs and is seen after the tooth has erupted through the bone and it is yet to erupt through the soft tissue. Also, it shares the histological features with dentigerous cyst. It cannot transform into a dentigerous cyst because by definition, dentigerous cyst is always associated with an impacted tooth. So the only answer which can be correct here is that it requires no treatment and ruptures spontaneously. Now coming on to our last doubt, which says the type of malocclusion seen in achondroplasia is due to, and your options are A, retruded maxilla, B, prognathic mandible, C, retruded maxilla and prognathic mandible, and D, maxillary and mandibular prognathism, mandible being more prognathic. The correct answer here is A, retruded maxilla. So if you remember the cardinal features of achondroplasia are short stature, Rhizomelic shortening of arms and legs, a long trunk, mid-facial hypoplasia, frontal bossing, thoracolumbar prominence and limited joint motion. Now, because of mid-facial uh, hypoplasia, the maxilla is underdeveloped 
and in relation to this underdeveloped maxilla the mandible appears to be prognathing and and because of this disparity in size between retruded maxilla and appearing prognathic mandible malocclusion is seen so the correct answer here will be retruded maxilla i hope these explanations were helpful thank you